Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Welcome to Great Women in Compliance on the Compliance Podcast Network. I'm Mary Shirley, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Amy Barnard Barn. Amy is an experienced executive who has worked at Fortune 20 companies and nonprofits, such as McKesson, Allianz, and the California Dental Association, leading multiple functions, including human resources, compliance, legal, IT, and communications. She's done a lot. Now, as an executive coach and strategic advisor, Amy helps boards and leaders design exceptional work environments that enable organizations to outbehave and outperform the competition. Amy is a leading columnist at Compliance Week and a favorite guest on the Compliance Podcast Network, covering CEO, board, and governance best practices. She is a fellow at the Institute of Coaching at McLean Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Current clients include First Republic Bank, The Gap, and Adobe. A lifelong diversity advocate, Amy recently testified in multiple legislative committees on the successful passage of California Senate Bill 826, the first law in the U.S., requiring corporate boards to include women. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Amy, as an executive coach, you have a wealth of valuable advice and information that I'd like to tap into today. First off, at a high level, I think it goes without saying that we're still bumping our heads up against the glass ceiling. From the Me Too era only just recently gathering steam to the evidence that women continue to be paid less than men, what is it that you think is the key to breaking through the glass ceiling and what can and should we all be doing together to break through it? Well, Mary, women need to support each other. You know, a few weeks ago, I spoke at the Bay Area 2020 Women on Boards event where we had 600 top women leaders and some fantastic male sponsors from Mm -hmm. the How Women Lead Network. And so in terms of breaking through the glass ceiling, I thought I'd share the pledge of support that we took for each other there. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really amazing. So we all took a pledge. Number one, no tearing each other down, which unfortunately happens, kind of a phenomenon. Agree. So we agreed to not do that. Number two, we agreed to say yes to helping and connecting each other. And most importantly, not filtering our support. Mm -hmm. The filtering is kind of a behavior that women need to change. Men are better at this. They're better at directly supporting each other with getting business and making connections. So we agreed that if a woman that we know asked for an introduction, we would say yes. Great. And then third and very important, reinforcing women's voices, whether it's in meetings or in messaging. Women sometimes speak and they're not heard. And so we agree to help each other get credit and be a supportive echo chamber, whether it's in a meeting. I know you've, you've probably read about the phenomenon where a woman, you know, says something and then a man says it, you know, five minutes later and yep. everyone nods in agreement and is excited about it. And so mm-hmm. one thing we can do as women and men can help us out here, too, is to say, you know, Julie just mentioned that a few minutes ago. Why don't we ask her to reiterate what she was thinking when she said that? Great. Good advice. Um, yeah. And so beyond this pledge. The other thing that I would say, in addition to women supporting other women, it's really critical for all leaders to be aware of their impact on other people. Fundamentally, in my coaching and leadership work, I found that leaders succeed or fail based on two things, how well they work with others and how well they know themselves. And leaders really should ask for a 360 review every couple of years where they're reviewed up, down, and across as kind of an effectiveness health check. Effective leaders need a good balance of assertiveness and approachability, and they need to see how they're doing on that. Great. That all sounds amazing. And for me, that first one is so important of ensuring that women really look out for other women and support them. And interestingly, we do have that particular topic of the phenomenon of other women being an obstacle in the workplace to the advancement of female colleagues. So keep an ear out for that one in the future. Great. Great. I look forward to it. Earlier this year in a Barker Gilmore compensation report, the executive search company reported some bittersweet findings of their analysis of compliance salaries. 
On the one hand, at the lower levels in compliance, that is the more junior staff, there is generally pay parity amongst the genders. Now, that's a nice win and great to see. On the other hand, Barker Gilmore reports that at the senior levels, such as chief compliance officer, female compliance officers earn only 65% of the total compensation that their male peers do. Obviously, some of this is out of the hands of candidates looking for a new job, and the responsibility of gender equality is also within the hands of employers. However, to the extent that we can influence outcomes here, what is your advice? How can women best negotiate for salaries equivalent to their male counterparts, or even better where it's warranted? You know, I would say you really need to know the going market rate for your job in your geography. And this is a great question, and I thought about where I've gone to get the data. And there are three places that I've gone to try to get data when I've negotiated for a job or helped other people. The first thing is to ask other colleagues, you know, really network and just candidly ask confidentially, you know, can you, do you mind sharing with me? And of course, are you share with them? So you trade and that helps both of you. It's very helpful. The second way is to interview in jobs and ask what the pay range is. And sometimes companies are a little dodgy or or obtuse about it, but you get some indication usually. And then the third area is to consult salary surveys. Sometimes those are public. You have to take those a little bit with a grain of salt because they're not always statistically validated using best HR practices. And then in some cases, you can actually buy a salary survey. But I would say if you've gotten some feedback from colleagues, you've been interviewing in the market to some degree, and you've looked at some salary surveys you can get data points that are usually good for two to three years. So you can gather this over time and just kind of have it in your back pocket. Right. The other thing I would say is that women don't talk salary and we need to get more comfortable sharing this. We just kind of need to get like leave the ego at the door and share the data. In one job, I was able to negotiate a 30% base salary increase because I knew the market so well. And I had very mm-hmm. specific data points to share with my future boss and I can tell you, he was a CEO, he would not have budged and initially didn't until I shared my very specific data points. And I don't think he was trying to, you know, he's a tough negotiator, he's a CEO, it's his job. And the company hadn't hired for the role in a really long time. So I I don't think he knew the market. So my advice would be, you know, come to the bargaining table with objective information and definitely stay polite and professional. You may not get the bump, but it's always worth a shot. Absolutely. And I think there are some managers nowadays who are almost disappointed in candidates and think poorly of them if they don't at least try to negotiate, right? Because how savvy are you going to be on the other end of the business table when working for that company if you're not able to fight for yourself and advocate for fair salary when earning your loaf of bread for the week? Absolutely. And you also get a sense early on regarding other pay and performance discussions you're going to have with your boss. You get an early sense of how they handle these types of discussions, which is just important for preparing for the next one. Yep. Another source that I would say, I guess there are mixed results, would be chatting with recruiters. And the reason why I think results can be mixed is that it's quite subjective. So they will value your experience differently depending on the person and their level of experience as well. And so I like to not rely on just one person's view. So if you have a few recruiters that headhunt for your industry, it's worth a casual conversation with them to hear what they're thinking is about right for your level of experience in your market, but making sure that you get multiple views. Yeah, absolutely. Recruiters can be very helpful. And it's always going to be a range, right? And so they can help you with that range. And again, also with geographies. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes I find this is not at the beginning of getting a job, but just to get a market almost appraisal, I like to ask if someone approaches me about a role and I have no interest in shifting, I don't see anything wrong with saying, thanks so much for thinking of me for this role. I'm not actively looking right now. I am curious, however, as to what the range might be for this employer that they're willing to pay Mm -hmm. out for this position. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Gives you a bit more idea. Absolutely. On the HR side, where you have significant experience as well, what do you think is the answer to this challenge we have been attempting to surmount as a global society? 
How can companies feel confident that they're doing their best to combat inequitable salaries for different genders? In the companies that I've worked at, we worked very hard to get this right. And I'd say mm-hmm. companies can do their part in ensuring that there's no gender-based pay inequity mm-hmm. by, number one, participating in purchasing quality salary survey data mm-hmm. for their jobs. Number two, having accurate updated job descriptions for their jobs. Number three, having job families that clearly outline the succession and promotion opportunities within kind of the growth span of the job. And then the fourth, and perhaps most important, the first three are really baseline building the right infrastructure Mm -hmm. to ensure that there's not disparity. But the fourth is to actually conduct an equity audit. If you've got enough incumbents in the job, then you can make a comparison and evaluate whether there is a material pay disparity between genders or race or age that can't otherwise be justified based on work quality or expertise. Obviously, if somebody, you know, has better work quality or they've been a very senior level as opposed to someone quite new to the role, you know, that's a good reason for paying someone more money. It's just if it's in unexplained or if you have, you know, brand new people who are brand new, no experience, and they're coming in at different rates, you'd really want to look at that. And mm-hmm. it's interesting what's been going on here in California. California recently passed a law to address the gender pay gap by, number one, starting January of this year. They are prohibiting employers from asking job candidates for prior salary information. And then second, they're also requiring mm-hmm. companies when asked by job applicants to provide a salary range for the job. And so it's a little too early to tell whether this has made a difference, but it certainly puts more power in the hands of job applicants. Right. In terms of, you know, because a lot of times if you put your prior salary, even if the company had a higher salary range, they might say, well, you know, a 10% increase over their past salary is still a pretty good deal. And so you can have a compounded, potentially, you know, a pay gap lagging from company to company. And this can happen for anyone, but there's a lot of research indicating that for women, it, it really compounds over the years, and then it can lead to these whopping gaps that we see in some of the articles that we've read. Absolutely. And I always have the feeling of, you know, just a small increase on an existing salary. I mean, people wouldn't be looking if they were super satisfied with their current position, right? So Mm -hmm. circumstances Mm -hmm. are making them want to leave. I was just wondering about the audits. So this is a great idea. And as someone who's not done them before, it raised a couple of questions for me. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that it can be done beyond, say, having a large compliance pool? So for example, maybe looking at your direct reports into the CEO, so that'd be across all the different cross functions of a company, you could audit like that? Yeah, I mean, most thorough HR departments do this. A good compensation person can look across and get averages and tenure. You could do a, a matrix of you know, gender, age, race, tenure at the company, how many years in the profession that requires usually a little more Mm -hmm. manual deep dive. You're kind of investigating and grabbing the data and then just measuring it up and saying, okay, does this feel right to me? Does this feel fair? And, and often you may need to go to the manager and look at rankings, you know, that kind of thing. It's great to do it for big jobs where there's a lot of people because that's when the disparities, you have more data points Mm -hmm. and you can see that. Does that make sense? Totally. And I think you touched on what I was about to follow up with, which is it sounds like your internal HR would be a good place to start for this, or would it be better practice to go for an external consultant to do this audit? I think companies usually do it internally. I don't know that if they're getting salary surveys, that's another way just to make sure they're staying current with the market. And so often, companies every three to five years will do a thorough compensation Mm -hmm. evaluation, both to make sure that it is current to market. So they're not losing people to the market or underpaying or overpaying. Sometimes, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, it goes the other way too. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, as our global economy shifts, some jobs are automated or Mm -hmm. they aren't worth as much. And so there can be unpleasant surprises here too. It doesn't always go up, but leaving that aside, they can look for demographic disparate impact at the same time as they're looking at market pay. And that's an efficient time to do it. Cool. 
That's awesome. Well, I hope that it's given some inspiration to folks who haven't heard of it and maybe worth checking in with your HR teams to see if they're working on this type of audit as an initiative. Yeah, well, as you can imagine, there's reasons beyond just being a good ethical mm-hmm. company. This can yeah. get you in super hot water with a disparate impact discrimination suit. So mm-hmm. there are compliance reasons to do it as well. Fantastic. A great partnering opportunity, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Turning to other salary considerations, I was disheartened to read that women who wear makeup are getting paid more at work based on recent studies. We also know, and I think this has been looked into for many years now for both men and women, that generally folks who are considered more conventionally attractive get paid more across both genders. What can we be doing to make sure that performance is recognized and commensurate remuneration is paid to us rather than reward being based on our outward appearance? This is a great one. You know, my perspective on this is that good grooming is really important. And I don't think that that has to include a lot of makeup. Some people look fantastic without any makeup. And some of us maybe need a little help. Um, (laughs) But it's all in the eye of the beholder. And I'll talk a little about this in a minute, too. It's all depending on the corporate culture, too. In the big picture, most executive women I know don't what I would call over-groom because they don't want their physical presence to speak louder than their content. Right. And that gets really important, I think, the more senior you get, depending on your industry. I remember when I was a young attorney, I was so afraid of judges not taking me seriously or opposing counsel taking advantage of Mm -hmm. my inexperience Mm -hmm. that I wore eyeglasses to moderate my age and to help project a more business-like versus a social-ish image. Did you need them? Yeah, I did. Not yep. super. Like I need them to drive. I didn't need mm-hmm. them to like, you know, read anything. But mm-hmm. but I don't know. It just made me stand up a little straighter. And this is, you know, when I was in my 20s and just gotten my practicing license and had to do law in motion and trial work. But I would say that in any organization, there's a tribal element to fitting in. And how you dress is a part of the culture. And, you know, I have clients all over the country and it's most pronounced and fascinating when I go say from Silicon Valley to the Bay Area because I work in banks and I work in the entertainment industry and I work in startup tech. Mm -hmm. So some companies are super casual, like my tech clients in Silicon Valley. You would stand out if you wore a suit. They would think you're interviewing or doing something weird. (laughs) But then there's the image industries, which are like, you know, beauty, fashion and entertainment, and they're going to expect more right? in more savvy, more fashion forward, that kind of thing. But what I would wear to a bank board meeting and what I do wear is very different than what I wear to my entertainment client in Hollywood, where the men wear three piece suits still, you know, in Beverly Hills. And then for the same entertainment client, though, I dress differently when I go to their millennial staffed music division in Manhattan. And so you need to understand who you're, I try to make sure that I know who I'm speaking to, so they can hear what I have to say. And they're not actually So that what I'm wearing or how I look is not a distraction. I want them to focus Mm -hmm. on my content. And so I would encourage leaders and women to focus on the broader issue of developing and cultivating an executive presence, no matter what level you are at the organization. And the grooming and wardrobe and makeup and all that is part of establishing an executive presence. But it's also in equal measure of your posture, your tone of voice, your Mm -hmm. eye contact, And then perhaps most importantly, projecting warmth and really connecting with your audience, serving your audience. Sounds a little bit like you're leading with executive presence rather than beauty aspects. I would really focus on that. Yeah. Yeah. Curious to know, do you believe in the old adage, dress for the job you want, not the job you have? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. That was always stated when... I think even before I was in the workforce, it was something that I knew of. And I'm curious as to whether it's been an enduring trend or whether it's fallen out of fashion. I also like your tip about really ensuring that how you present yourself is that you're fitting in with your audience so that you're establishing rapport, they can understand that they can relate to you and you're one of their people because we know Mm -hmm. that that's what creates relationships, good, strong relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're only, if you're interviewing or you're presenting for the first time, I think that's really important. 
it's really a matter of respect if you really think about it. People are so focused on individuality, and I'm all for that in your off time. But when you are presenting to someone, I think when you take the time to understand what the tribal signals are and how other people dress, it's actually demonstrating respect for what is and what you've been invited to potentially become a part of, however temporary or permanent that is. Yeah, good observations there. You've done some great work on focusing on what makes a true leader as opposed to someone who just manages or supervises. What are your best tips for women who want to demonstrate the next step? Not just that they're capable of managing a team of staff, but that they're seen as visionaries and influential leaders who can gain the trust and confidence of both their teams and other colleagues. You know, I love this quote from Jack Welch that illustrates this. And he said, before you're a leader, success is all about growing yourself. But when you become a leader, success is all about growing others. Love that one. Yeah. You know, managing is easy and leading is really hard. I find actually in my coaching practice that when people get promoted, the hardest thing for them is that they have to give up and let go of the very things that made them successful and that got them the promotion in the first place, which is often being the technical expert and having the right answer. Yes. In their old role as an individual contributor, you know, employee potentially, their number one focus was on accomplishing their own tasks and executing, getting it done, delivering results. And when you get promoted and you lead people, there's a mental shift you really need to make around your number one focus, helping other people accomplish their tasks. And this is not easy because most, many people, most people I'd say are promoted for their technical expertise and they're not always given the support they need to learn how to lead. It's like, great, here you go. Here's your new title. Good luck. You know, <laughs> push right. off the cliff like the baby birds out of the nest. And all of us can relate to having worked for people who were pushed out of the nest and, and wishing they knew more about mm-hmm. it and we're getting some help. And so I'd say the number one thing women need to do to be viewed as an influential leader is to make that mindset shift from me to we. Yep. And the we specifically being the well-being of the entire organization, you know, not just the subject matter expert in their area. I mean, that's the ticket to the game. Mm-hmm. I don't want to discount that. I mean, you can't even, you know, get to an executive level if you haven't perfected your area of expertise, but that's kind of the training ground. Once you get promoted beyond that, you need to see beyond your subject matter expertise and really demonstrate through your actions that you understand the overall business strategy and that you're always acting in the best interests of the entire organization, that you're not there to protect your team's interests, to just fight for your team. Makes me a little crazy when I hear people say, Oh, I have to fight for my team. It's like, Oh, not really. Like, <laughs> you want to stay there forever. Okay. But that's not demonstrating partnership and overall best interests of the whole organization. You're not going to be seen as a real leader that has the best interests of the company and the organization at heart. So, you know, we're masters in compliance at evaluating situations from all angles for risk. So, I've actually found that I think compliance people and lawyers have a unique capability if they can make, we've already learned how to analyze situations from all levels, seeing around the corner. And if we can shift and apply that same incredible skill that we've honed, adopting the organizational perspective of overall business strategy, operating model, you've got a very powerful capability to be an executive leader that oversees functions beyond just your own. And I would love to see more people who have come up through compliance and ethics be CEOs and be on executive teams and be on boards of directors because God knows we need it. I think that's right. And one of the frames of mind or approaches that I have taken when managing is to have the goal in mind that I want to make my team members more valuable to the company than I am by the time I leave. If I have done that, then I'll know that I've done a good job. And I have found that genuinely believing that has made me really vested in setting my eye on that prize and giving them the best support that I can to not only work with me, but then become nice and valuable and can fly the nest, if you will, if we want to use that metaphor. And that's worked really well for me. Yeah, that's a great, great approach. We just mentioned earlier how, you know, there are some leaders who are essentially thrown into their positions due to their technical capabilities, but they may not be the most effective or capable leaders. 
So for those instances where it's difficult to gauge our effectiveness as a leader, especially for those who are new to managing teams, what would you identify as the signs that someone is in need of coaching to become a better leader? A yeah, great question. I have found that my executive coaching clients generally fall into two groups. One would be what I would call strong start clients where they're in a new role or they're starting at a new company. There's been a promotion or a job change and they want help, you know, especially first hundred days getting a plan together and having a confidant to really help them map out, you know, what worked well in their prior roles, what didn't maybe work so well, how do they want to take their lessons learned forward into their new job with confidence and quickly assimilating into the culture and getting some wins. Right. And then the second group I would say is what I would call a leadership discovery group where people may have gotten stuck or stalled in their career, Mary. And you know, for some reason, whatever got them to this point in their career is not working anymore. Right. You know, they may have not have gotten the promotion that they were, that, and it's heartbreaking and they can't figure out why they didn't get it. Or they've been given some really tough feedback about why they didn't get it. And it's blindsiding them and they need some help kind of working through that and owning it and moving forward. Or they may have a new boss and things were great and then boom, oh my gosh, things are not working. Mm -hmm. And they realize that and they want to figure that out. So these things can be very challenging to manage alone. And so having someone outside the organization can kind of create a safe space, enabling learning. And I know this because with each executive role that I took in my career, I hired mm -hmm. a coach. Yeah. Either some, sometimes the company paid for it. And even when they didn't, I paid for it. And, it, you know, it's, it was investing in myself. It was some of the best things I ever did, which is how I actually got into coaching because I found it so incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for your time and always sage advice, Amy. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. To wrap up for today, in the book, How Women Rise, co-author Sally Halgerson reports back on studies she has run on female partners in professional services firms to find out what they believe their success has been attributable to. There are two consistent pieces of feedback when asked to comment on younger women in their firms. First, there is a strong consensus that the quality of work of their less experienced counterparts is phenomenal. But when asked what the women were worst at, the overwhelming commentary was that they are the worst at bringing attention and exposure to their accomplishments. I know from personal experience that it can feel like you're not being a team player or coming across as boastful or even arrogant when sharing your successes. That's always been my take. And it's only been fairly recently where I've taken concerted efforts to be better at this. A common response cited by Sally Halgerson is that many women believe that if they produce quality work, then people should notice. And of course, if we lived in an ideal world, so it should. But I know you don't need me to spell out for you that our reality is far less optimal than that. I have found LinkedIn a great way to share accomplishments. You can start small by presenting clever observations to articles that you've shared and build up to a post about a successful accomplishment or accolade. Another solution that Christy Grant Hart suggests in her book, How to Be a Wildly Effective Compliance Officer, is that you can create a compliance dashboard with updates, which is particularly useful when you may be reporting into supervisors or a board who may not be terribly au fait with compliance. So it helps to explain to them what you're up to. A more basic form of that idea is a simple weekly status update for your boss. So even if they are a compliance superstar, there's a good chance you combat several tasks, the extent of work they're not always aware of. And of course, there's always the idea of giving back. Why not draw attention to the fabulous work or awards your colleagues and friends have won? Got more ideas on how to comfortably engage in some gentle self-promotion? Feel free to join our LinkedIn group, the Great Woman in Compliance podcast community, and share ideas with the crew. Don't be invisible a second longer. That was Amy barnard Barn and Mary Shirley on the Great Woman in Compliance podcast on Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.